how do you start a video about quantum computing without using Moore's law? Feynman? Eh, everybody does that. When I hear people talk about Schrödinger's cat, I reach for my gun. Allegedly a Stephen Hawking quote and I'm 100% with him on this one. It's, it's the one thing that annoys me the most about portrayals of quantum mechanics, how Schrödinger's cat is put into the picture. Especially as it has become almost a colloquial term by now and is used for anything that's in any vague sense two things at the same time. Anyway, there's been a lot of hype about quantum computers recently and they're being sold as the next big thing. Quantum leap, dude! In evolution of computers, um, surpassing even the, the fastest supercomputers we have today in every way possible. But are they? Should you believe the hype? Yes. And no. You know, like the cat. I didn't use Moore's law. And I incorporated that damn cat. I'm delighted and annoyed at the same time. Almost like Moore's Law, you ask? Perfect choice. That's the best introduction to quantum computing. Quantum computing has always been a topic that's somewhat close to my heart because I wrote my master's thesis on it, uh, more specifically on um, entanglement distillation and quantum error correction. So it was always clear to me that uh, when I was writing the list of topics for this channel that quantum computing would have to be one of the first videos. First up, I've chosen the, the title of this video very deliberately. So it's Potentials and Promises of Quantum Computers and not How do Quantum Computers Work. Um, that does not mean I'm not going to make further videos about that, but it will take way more than one. So this video is just supposed to give you an overall idea what quantum computers are about and what we can potentially achieve with them and uh, which is just overblown hype. So if you want to know more about qubits or entanglement or Shor's algorithm, stay tuned. There will be videos on this in future. At the time, we don't even know what the best physical realization of quantum computers will be. So there are many possibilities, photon-based or ions in traps or electrons caught in specific potentials. There's lots of possibilities and all of them have advantages but also issues. The main problem is you want quantum computers to be quantum, so they will have to retain their quantum properties and in order to do so you have to isolate them really, really well. So you have to create ultra high vacuum or um, cool down the entire system to almost absolute zero and stuff like that. Because if you don't do that, these systems will always interact with their environment. And this means that all the useful quantum properties will be lost. This process is called decoherence and it is one of the most fundamental problems we face with uh, realizing quantum computers. In fact, with today's technology, we can only ever keep decoherence at bay for a certain time. So the question is only how much time do we get for calculations and operations until decoherence inevitably wins in the end. And that's the reason why we will probably, from today's perspective, never have a simple consumer product uh, quantum computer like uh, a smart device in your pocket or a computer on your desktop because in a normal environment they just would not work. It's actually even one step worse than that because while on the one hand you have to isolate your system to retain its quantum nature, you also have to interact with it because you want to do calculations and read output and also inter enter input. And whatever operation you perform, whatever you do in, an, in a real computer, you will always have noise, you will always have um, random error. The good news is that physicists found out that quantum error correction exists and can work. So in general what you have to do is you have to trade in more resources, so more qubits, more states, and with that you can encode your state in a more uh, stable form 
that will not be affected by these errors or by this noise. So you have a trade-off, resources versus noise. And while physicists have shown that quantum error correction is possible, we still don't know, really know, if it will be feasible in a, in a realistic quantum computer. So the question remains um, that while we have shown that quantum error correction works in principle, will the actually occurring realistic noise be in a range where we can fix it? So are quantum computers better than classical computers? Yes and no. Again, in very simple terms, there are tasks that computers can perform efficiently, and these are called easy, and there are tasks that computers cannot perform efficiently, these are called hard tasks, and these require exponential resources. Uh, look at this map. For example, if you take two prime numbers and multiplicate them, that's an easy task. You could even, even do that manually. Um, on the other hand, if you start with a result and then ask the question, what are the two prime numbers that multiplicated give this result? That's an extremely hard task to compute. And while this might sound like a typical ivory tower problem with no applications, it does have very important applications. Actually, the fact that prime factoring is so hard to, to do is the basis for our most commonly used encryption uh, algorithm called RSA. And this is used to encrypt all manner of data from uh, credit card information, emails, and all manner of data stored by corporations, governments, etc. Back to the problem map. Um, now, it has been shown that some very, very specific problems that are hard for classical computers are actually easy to solve for quantum computers. But let me be clear, if we're not talking about these specific tasks, then quantum computers offer little or no advantage over classical computers. So we've mentioned that quantum computers can efficiently solve prime factoring. This is the famous um, Shor algorithm as introduced by Peter Shor in the 90s. And yes, this means that quantum computers, or at least mature quantum computers, could break most current encryption. And this is a very interesting situation from a game theory standpoint, because it means that, A, uh, it means we need to change the encryption protocols we use today to something that is not solvable for quantum computers. And B, people will try to get quantum computers before this change is made. And with people, I mean the NSA, CIA, and their Chinese and Russian counterparts, of course. You know. And this is certainly the main reason why a technology that is so immature in many respects has gotten so much attention, because there is so much to gain right now. The second most important quantum algorithm is the Grover algorithm, which gives you a speed up uh, when searching unsorted lists. The speedup is not as pronounced as with Shor, so it's not an exponential speedup, just, just a quadratic speedup. But still, that means instead of a million operations, you only have to do a thousand. Also, um, searching a list and everything that is connected to that has a lot, a lot of practical applications. So unlike Shor, which will become useless as soon as encryption protocols are changed, this is a benefit that will stay for quantum computers. One of the associated problems where Grover can also be applied is optimization, which means that, um, for example, you can solve the traveling salesman problem more efficiently. So essentially a route navigation, for example, or also um, machine learning. And finally, as proposed by Feynman, da -da -da, da -da -da. Feynman uh, in the 80s. If you want to simulate quantum systems, you can only really do that efficiently using quantum systems. And this has many applications, for example, in uh, material research or battery research, which at the most fundamental level are quantum problems. What's left at the end of the day? 
Um, quantum computers can break encryption until RSA is phased out. They're good at sorting things and optimization. And they can um, simulate quantum systems because they are quantum systems. Of course, there's always the hope that as soon as we get bigger quantum computers and um, more people are involved, that we can find more advantages and even more powerful algorithms. But for the time being, that's the picture. Quantum computers are extremely effective at some very specific things and not a big advantage in everything else. We cannot say at the moment whether we've only scratched the surface and there is way more waiting for us or maybe we already know the most important and fundamental bits and the applications for quantum computing will always only be narrow. So, Quantum computers might either be the next big revolution in information technology or just a useful specialist application. Or both. At the same time. No, no, this nonsense has to stop. We're done. Cut, cut.